first half of October 1942. The war of ideology within the war is heating up. Active resistance to Axis occupation is growing, and predictably, the Axis strike back. But it's not just the occupiers retaliating. Often, it is collaborators killing their fellow countrymen. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In late September, we saw how the Quit India movement continued to escalate into violence by the British colonial masters against Indians seeking independence. The 100 deadliest days of the Holocaust reaped another 200,000 lives. Resistance continued to grow across occupied territory. In German-occupied USSR, civilians caught between the Nazis and the partisans were no longer enemies of both sides, when Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin changed the nature of the partisan war from an ideological insurrection against Nazism to a defensive war of liberation. And resistance continues to grow in October, but so do the reprisals. At the end of September in Greece, the headquarters of the Hellenic Socialist Patriotic Organization, or ESPO, the Greek Nazis if you like, was bombed by Greek partisans. The ESPO was founded in the summer of 1941 to facilitate German labor requests and to help recruit Greek volunteers for the Eastern Front. Between 29 and 39 German agents and Greek collaborators, including ESPO leader Dr. Spiros Sterodimas, die in the attack, effectively destroying the ESPO organization. The Nazi occupiers and their helpers are now carrying out an intensive manhunt to find the perpetrators. In Poland, on the night between October 7th and 8th, members of the Polish Home Army begin a concerted effort to target German infrastructure like railroads, bridges, and depots around Warsaw and Lublin. In the first action, eight teams totaling 40 men and women detonate explosives and destroy eight railway lines around Warsaw, heavily impacting German supply lines in the area. The Germans retaliate by killing 89 prisoners of the Paviak prison on October 15th. In Belgium, the resistance starts to gain traction in its recruiting efforts. The beginning of deportations of Belgian Jews this past summer had no measurable effect on an increase in resistance. Although the Jewish Help Organization has been founded and are trying to at least hide children from deportation by taking them into non-Jewish families. Instead, like in France last month. It is the increase of forced labor assignments through a new regulation on October 8th that triggers a new influx of volunteers. But their actions are hampered by a lack of Allied support and effective German countermeasures. In Norway, the British Special Operations Executive are actively aiding the resistance movement to carry out a steady increase of activity. The German occupation is led by Reichskommissar Josef Terboven, known for his capricious outbreaks of violence and rule with an iron fist. Although the occupation of Norway is a de facto situation of martial law, Terboven has his own definition of martial law, which basically means terror. Last month, he put Oslo, Asker, and Berum under martial law for a week to carry out raids looking for resistance cells. One act of resistance that has especially angered Terbofen was the shooting of two German police officers at Maya Vatten in Trondheim on September 6th. Now in October comes Terbofen's revenge. He arrives in the town by train on October 5th. The next morning puts the region under civilian martial law. He has mobilized 13,000 German and Norwegian Nazi policemen and soldiers with over 3,000 vehicles to enforce his measures. In a public gathering, including most of his forces in the town main square, he claims that inferior racial elements have colluded with the emigrant clique in London, promising that he will find those that pull the strings, threatening that this evening the public will become familiar with how this principle is put into action. Publication of all newspapers are stopped, private assemblies are forbidden, a curfew from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. imposed, and the use of long-distance transportation forbidden. The Norwegian fascist party Gauleiter of the region, Henrik Rogstad, feels inclined to do his bit to help the Nazi cause and adds a prohibition of all sales of tobacco. 
In the evening, Terbofen returns to the main square to proclaim that 10 prominent members of Trondheim society have been executed as retribution. In the next day, 1,434 residential properties are raided, several dozen Norwegian Jewish men are deported to the extermination factories, and 93 non-Jewish Norwegians arrested. Another 33 of them are executed, bringing the total immediate death toll to 43. On October 12th, Terbofen ironically deems that law and order has been restored and lifts his extrajudicial state of lawlessness. Norwegians working with Germans against their own countrymen is not the only act of murderous collaboration in these two weeks. You might remember Operation Trio in Yugoslavia, when Italians, fascists, Croats of the NDH, the Serb Chetniks, and Germans partly fought each other, but also faced off together against the Yugoslav partisans this spring. The partisans slipped away in the chaos to regroup in new places. By now, they have built up a significant presence in the region around the town of Prozor, inside of the Croat Ustasha Nazi client state. As we have seen, the Ustasha have operated systematic ethnic cleansing of Serbs in Croatia since over a year, with concentration camps and multiple mass murders. In Serbia, there have been repeated incidents of terror and mass murder against Croats. In an unusual move of cooperation, Serb Chetnik forces under command of Trifunovic Birchanin, on direct orders by Chetnik leader Draja Mihailovic, have now teamed up with the 15th Regiment of the Croatian Home Guards and the Croat Air Force, with heavy Italian support from Acting General Mario Ruata. Their aim is to smoke out their common enemy, the partisans, from the region around Prozor. The action is led by Chetnik operational commanders Dobroslav Yevdjevic and Peter Bacovic, with the Italians and Croats as auxiliary forces. Early October, they fight their way through the region, with the partisans mostly slipping away as they advance. On October 7th, the heavily armed, air-supported, roughly 5,000-man-strong anti-partisan coalition arrive at the town Prozor itself, where there are no more than 300 partisans. The outnumbered partisans quickly decide to make haste and disappear into the countryside. Without any idea of possible partisan forces, the Italian-Serb-Croat coalition proceed to bomb the town. When they march into Prozor on October 8th, Mihailovic messages Yevdjevic and Bacovic that now is the definite time to wipe out the communists. He urges tactical restraint against the Muslims and Croats, but also says that Muslims must only be organized under the command of our Chetnik military leaders and in our struggle against the Ustasha and the communists with complete loyalty to the Serb population to repair the shameful role they've played since the capitulation of Yugoslavia up to today. He goes on to propose that any Muslims fighting at their side should take part in the liquidation of those Muslims who still today work against the Serb people, and adds that after liquidation of communists, they will be able to liquidate the Ustasha. October 14th, the Chetniks under Jevjevic and Bacovic let loose their terror on the region, burning down houses and murdering Croat and Muslim men, women, and children. It's unclear exactly how many they kill, but it could be as many as 2,500. On October 23rd, Bacovic will report to Mihailovic that in the operation of Prozor, we slaughtered more than 2,000 Croats and Muslims. Our soldiers returned enthusiastic. Ruata issues formal protests, and Muslim Chetnik leader Izmet Popovac arrives and also tries to urge restraint. But they are talking to deaf ears, and Jevjevic and Bacevic's forces continue to terrorize Croats, Muslims, and unsupportive Serbs. And while the Yugoslavs continue killing their own countrymen on purpose, the Allies are doing it by tragic mistake. In the weekly episode from October 2nd, Indy told you about the Lisbon Maru, the Japanese ship transporting 1,800 British POW that gets torpedoed by the Allies and sinks. When the Japanese refused to let the POW leave the sinking ship, even opening fire on them from adjacent ships, 825 POW die. The Lisbon Maro is what is becoming known as a hell ship used to transport Allied POW between locations in the Pacific. Thousands of POW are being crammed together inside windowless hulls of transport ships with insufficient food and water, without ventilation and sanitation. 
The journeys often last weeks, causing many to starve, suffocate, or die of disease. To make things even worse, the hell ships are unmarked and often also ship goods, weapons, and soldiers, making them viable targets for Allied submarines and aircraft ignorant of their captured comrades' presence. And while these POW are suffering, Germany and the Western Allies get into a diplomatic and propaganda war about their mutual POW. During the Dieppe raid back in August, the British took some German prisoners. The British tied their hands together and in some cases blindfolded the prisoners to avoid them from escaping before they could be processed as POW. Not only did reports on this practice reach the Germans, but they also recovered the British order specifying the treatment during the raid. Now, the shackling of prisoners of war in an active war zone is kind of a gray zone within the definition of war crimes in the Geneva Convention. But according to the Nazi political situation report for the Reich, the German population is outraged by the event. So the Nazis seized the opportunity for a public propaganda campaign. Now in October, the German OKV proclaims that all British and Canadian POW taken at Dieppe will be shackled as well, at least until the British government in London apologizes. It's hard to not see the irony here, what with the enslavement and murder of millions of POW on the German side. Conditions that are not unknown to the Allies. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill sees it for what it is, and instead of apologizing, escalates the situation in a statement saying, Should the German government persist in their intention, His Majesty's government will be compelled to protect their own prisoners of war to take similar measures upon an equal number of enemy prisoners of war in their hands. The SS reports to the Nazi leadership that this spooks the German population, but by now the conflict has taken on a life of its own. The Germans announced that 1,376 Allied prisoners are now shackled, and that three times more will be if the Allies carry out their threats. The British government then puts 1,376 German prisoners in manacles, and in the following days the Germans carry out their announced counter-reprisal as well. In Canada, where some of the 16,000 German prisoners are detained, they're tied there as well. Tensions begin to rise. The Canadians aren't pleased with the request from London, especially as a majority of the prisoners from Dieppe are Canadian. The German POW won't have it either, and on October 10th, around 400 German prisoners start a riot in the Bowmanville camp because 100 of them were put in shackles. A two-day battle is fought with tear gas, fire hoses, bricks, chairs, and baseball bats, wounding 100 inmates and soldiers. The retaliatory shackling on both sides have not ended by mid-month. And while the Allies and Germany exchange barbs over what is in context of the horror of this war relatively petty issues, hundreds of thousands of civilians are mercilessly murdered in occupied Poland. The first two weeks of October, the Nazis are mainly taking Jews from the Radom district to be killed in Treblinka. After the breakdown in August, the killing capacity there has been significantly increased by new gas chamber installations. Treblinka alone now has the capacity to murder 12,000 to 15,000 people a day. In Sobibor too, a new six-room gas chamber building becomes operational this month with the capacity to kill 1,500 people at one single time. By October 15th and 80 days, Operation Reinhardt has cost the lives of 1.1 million men, women, children, and infants, bringing the death toll of the Holocaust to 2.5 million so far. And although the resistance against the Nazis is growing, it is not mainly these millions of untimely deaths that is jostling people in occupied lands into action. Let us not fool ourselves. While in 1942 many are outraged and many protests have been heard by non-Jews in the still free world and most human beings, even in Nazi Germany, would never be willing or able to carry out these barbaric acts themselves. The indifference to the plight of the Jews is for the most part a resounding silence. 
From the first day of the Nazi takeover in 1933, although Adolf Hitler made his intentions to end Jewry and the world known across the globe, country after country has resisted to take on Jewish refugees. Even after the outbreak of war, Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, the US, Turkey, Cuba, and many others turned back many, many refugees coming by train, by plane, by foot, and by boat, sometimes condemning the people on board to a death beneath the waves, and almost always sending them back to an eventual death in the gas chambers. Let us not fool ourselves to think that in almost all of the German-occupied territories, there are just as many willing to help the Jews, if they only could, as there are who are now assisting in the mass genocide. Let us not fool ourselves to believe that although few people are as fanatical as the Nazis in their anti-Semitic madness, that there are not countless of millions across all the countries, both occupied and free, who agree with at least some of what the Nazis are saying about the Jews. Let us not fool ourselves to believe that anti-Semitism is a new idea in 1942. Let us not fool ourselves to believe that only a Nazi lunatic like Hitler, Himmler, or Heydrich could set out to kill the Jews. Let us remember that the millions who are dead are the victims of a dehumanization campaign that has gone on for centuries. Let us remember that the lies that have been told about them are only that, lies. Let us remember that they went to their early graves while most people turned their back. Let us remember that they were you and me, us, and now will only live on in our memories. Never forget.